Well, welcome to Super Sunday, the sequel. Well, welcome to Super Sunday, the week after. Now, there won't be any uh, puppy monkey babies or uh, Super Bowl babies, uh, no, uh, no Lombardi trophy. Uh, since we've already started, uh, Lady Gaga's not here to sing the national anthem. Uh, nobody's going to Disney World unless they pay for it themselves. But I promise you today there will be fewer mistakes than last week's game. I really hope there are fewer mistakes. Uh, there's no Beyonce or Bruno, Ma Bruno Mars, but Ramon Saldana has said he'll fire up some nice polka hits from the 50s if you slip him a few bucks, right? Well, what I guess I'm saying is welcome to an afternoon of sports celebration with a distinct panhandle flavor. Welcome to a gathering where the best of today and the best of yesterday are honored among their family, friends, and even rivals. Welcome to an idea that has stood the sometimes harsh test of time. Welcome to the 58th annual Panhandle Sports Hall of Fame ceremonies, or it's better known by this year, the Canadian High School Athletic Banquet. I'd like to thank Canadian Superintendent Kyle Lynch and coaches Chris Ketting and Andy Copley for letting us kind of slip in here a little bit. But 58 years, uh, more than half a century, <clears throat> that's a long time. It's longer than by eight years of the Super Bowl, and sometimes it's been longer than the Super Bowl, but uh, not lately. We've made some changes that have streamlined things. And we've made some major changes, too, for the better starting with our new lead uh, corporate sponsor, Kids Incorporated, which is really the perfect sponsor uh, for the Hall of Fame. And if 58 years sounds like a long time, Kids Inc. has been around by 13 years longer, 71 years to be exact. So this year, thanks to uh, Kids Inc. Executive Director Jimmy Lackey, we are in a new venue for the first time in forever. Uh, Amarillo College has been the site of this since uh, basketball had laces, but uh, we are in a bigger, a roomier site today. And eventually, sooner rather than later, uh, Kids Inc., their offices uh, will be the nice, roomy, permanent headquarters for the Hall of Fame. So for the 58th time, folks just like you have gathered to reflect and honor the local greats who have earned induction into this shrine that will total by the end of the afternoon to 170. Also, we'll honor the current crop of athletes and coaches who add to the rich sports tradition of the Panhandle. This afternoon, we will honor number 167, 168, 169, and 170 into the Hall of Fame. And this is pretty unique for this little top of Texas. You know, there aren't many regions which have something like this, or certainly not for this long. You know, I've talked to those outside of the area who have been to these, and they all seem to kind of say the same thing. Do you know how nice this is? And I wish we had something like this too. Well, there is one because a man named Putt Powell, longtime Globe News sports columnist, and advertising executive John Heatland put their energies and ideas together in the late 1950s, enlisted the help of the YMCA, and they built something a little special, a little unique, a lasting tribute to sports and the men and women who played them in the panhandle. And after their deaths, the baton was picked up by men like Garrett Von Netzer, Warren Hasse, and David Jones, among others, to continue on. And when the YMCA closed here, Kids Inc. enthusiastically stepped in. And so more than a half a century later, it's still going strong. It's going strong, I think, because the Hall of Fame is not so much about plaques and, and pictures on a wall, but it's about people. It's about those with dreams and, and goals, athletes and coaches who love being in the arena who get to this place by work and talent and, and the competitiveness to be the best they can every play, every game. You know, many of you in the audience are their support system. Those on stage here, I think, would be the first to say that they are, in so many words, a tree with a deep root system. And it extends to coaches and parents and wives and husbands 
older brother or sister, friends, and certainly to teammates. You know, many of you who have played a big role in their lives are here today and still in dresses and heels and coat and tie two hours after church. Some of you uh, may remember the ill-fated 2007 ceremonies when some old boy we didn't know, he, he came here in coat and tie and dresses and heels. And, uh, well, you know, it's all good. We're family. Anyway, the point is, we've all made sacrifices, and many of you who have played a role in their successes are in this audience. And so, in a way, their award is yours as well. Before we move along with the program, there are always uh, former members of the Hall of Fame who come back every year, mainly for the free food, I think, and to show off their hip replacement surgeries, but hey, they're still here. So would you please stand up so that uh, we can recognize you at this time? <laughs> And if you think, man, I'm tired of being stiffed. I think I deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. Would you stand, please, so we can recognize you? There we go. Okay. You know, I was going to quit saying that one of these years, but if somebody's going to stay, stand up, who am I to quit? Again, welcome to athletes, coaches, inductees, fan, friends, and family. You'll be glad you gave up a portion of your Sunday afternoon to be here. And now to voice our invocation is the executive director of Kids, Inc., the new corporate sponsor of the Hall of Fame, Mr. Jimmy Lackey. Thank you. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we just pause to give you thanks this afternoon together in this place to honor talent and perseverance, blood, sweat, and tears of these athletes, these coaches, their parents, their families and friends, and the gifts that you've given us to perform on the various fields and courts in the Panhandle of Texas. We thank you for this place we call home. Thank you for this time together today. We ask that you bless it in your name. These things we pray, amen. You know, a guy like me is not going to be up here long when his notes are on a piece of a box that the plaques came in uh, that I had to tear off the corner just to make some quick notes. So I'm not going to be here long. We are extremely excited to be a part of this ceremony. I've been to so many of these. And here's the deal. How many of you want to sit like a guy, by a guy like me on the airplane or at Ordway Hall any longer? Look at me. I take up three seats, and you don't want to have to sit next to me. And so you've got room to breathe. We're glad to be here. We thank the Civic Center for making this venue available to us and a lot of people on the back of your programs that made it possible for us to spend a little extra money to make this ceremony what we think it deserves for all these folks on the stage. So here's the deal. Make yourself at home. If you run out of water, feel free to get up and go get another one. We'll get you one if you need to. There's restrooms off to the right. But make yourselves at home and, and, and just know that we're glad that you're here. Lastly, if you like the venue, young lady standing right over here to my right is the one that put every one of the little details together today. Her name is Stacy Knight. She's the Director of Development and Public Relations at Kids Incorporated. I think she deserves a huge round of applause. If you don't like it, then blame me because it was my idea to move it here. Otherwise, I'm going to turn it back over to John Mark. Thank you, committee. Thank you for letting us be a part of this. We're extremely excited. Have a great day. Well, this is the portion of the program where the present paves way for the past. This is a day of recognition, not just for the careers and the lives of our four inductees today, but the current accomplishments by some who may one day themselves be inducted into the Hall of Fame. It's the honoring of the coaches and athletes of the year now in 10 sports. You know, the calendar year of, of 2015 was a typically strong year in the Panhandle. The Panhandle has always been fortunate to have some of the best coaching in the state. But that's not to diminish those who make it happen, the athletes. Those who, as distance running great Emil Zadopek said, compete with hope in their hearts and dreams in their heads. So let's meet 
the Athletes of the Year for 2015. In baseball, Derek O'Dell of Canyon was a solid, consistent, and dependable third baseman for baseball power TCU for four years. He averaged a hit a game for the Frogs during that time, 229 games, 229 hits. As a senior last spring, he played a key role in TCU's second consecutive trip to the College World Series. He hit 292 with 42 RBIs, which was second on the team, took along with 10 doubles, three home runs, and nine stolen bases. He had on-base percentage of 365 and was a steady hand at third base with a 944 fielding percentage and would earn honorable mention all Big 12 honors. It was in the postseason where he really shined. In the opening regional at Fort Worth, Derek could have been the MVP where he hit 368 with seven RBIs. The Frogs would go on to beat Texas A&M in the Super Regionals, culminating in a 16-inning 5-4 win. In three games, he hit 538 and scored three times. TCU advanced to the College World Series again where they finished in the Final Four and with a 51-15 record. In Derek's time at TCU, the Frogs went to one Super Regional and twice to the College World Series. Record the last two years, 99-33. and 33. A fixture for the TCU baseball team and winner of this award in 2010 and 2012, the Hall of Fame Baseball Player of the Year from Canyon and TCU, Derek O'Dell. Yeah, there's always a you come up and get your award. We'll do that. All right. In basketball, there are co-players of the year, one dominant in college and the other in high school. Shantiqua White of West Texas A&M won almost every award there was to win and named to just about any postseason team worth being on and leading the Lady Buffs to a 30-3 record and a berth in the NCAA Division II Elite Eight. The 5'10 Shantiqua, native of Dallas, averaged a team-high 17.8 points and 8.7 rebounds, a season that included nine double-doubles, meaning games of double figures and points and rebounds, and 12 games with more than 20 points. She also led WT in free throw percentage, hitting a remarkable 81.7%. For the third year in a row, she was all Lone Star Conference and was the LSC Player of the Year. In addition, she was a two-time academic All-American, graduating with a 3.48 uh, GPA in criminal justice. Regionally, she was the South Central Region Tournament Most Outstanding Player. Nationally, she was named to three All-American teams. First team on the Women's College Basketball Association, the Women's Division II Bulletin First Team, and the Dectronics Third Team. Finally, she was the LSC nominee for the 2015 NCAA Woman of the Year. Accepting is Jordan Vessels for the 2015 Co-Athlete of the Year in Basketball from West Texas A&M, Chantiqua White. Valerian Gutierrez was a big player from a small town. He was a six foot six post from the town of Texline, where there are 22 boys in high school, 17 of them playing basketball. And for three years, he was perhaps the most dominant high school boys basketball player in the Panhandle. As a sophomore, he averaged 23 points and 12 rebounds and was named the Globe News Super Team Player of the Year. As a junior, he was a super team first teamer and first team all state, averaging 26.4 points and 11 rebounds in leading the Tornadoes to the state tournament. But that was just the warm up in 2015 for his senior season, as he was the catalyst for the talented Tornadoes. They drove 611 miles one way to San Antonio for the 1A state basketball tournament and returned as state champions. Texline won their first two state tournament games by an average of 24 and a half points 
including 76 to 55 over Grady in the finals. Aaron had 67 points and 25 rebounds in the two games, 36 in the semifinals and 31 points and 12 rebounds in the finals as Tex Line finished with a 34-3 record and Aaron was named the 1A Tournament MVP. In earning Super Team Player of the Year honors and First Team All-State honors, Aaron averaged 28 points and 13 rebounds. And those numbers could have been a lot higher had not Texline been so far ahead in most games and he played sparingly in the second half. He's the Hall of Fame Co-Player of the Year in Basketball from Texline High School and I'm not sure if he's here, but hopefully he is, I'm not sure, but it's Aaron Gutierrez. Well, there was some question of whether Aaron would make it, and I don't guess he did, but we'll get that plaque to him. Well, in football, uh, you could make a very good argument that no high school quarterback in Panhandle history had a season quite like Tanner Schaefer of Canadian. Wins, stats, however you want to define it. On his way to leading the Wildcats to a 16-0 record, in the Class 2A Division I State Championship, Tanner was named the state's 2A Offensive Player of the Year by the Associated Press, as if it could be anyone else. In Canadian's version of the air raid offense, he found receivers time and time again, sometimes quickly, sometimes extending plays uh, with his scrambling. He threw for 49 touchdowns to just two interceptions. He completed a ridiculous 77% of his passes, 292 out of 377 for 4,053 yards. Imagine what he could have done if he had played in the second half, because he didn't play in many. In the 61 to 20 win over Referio in the state finals at NRG Stadium in Houston on December the 17th, Tanner entered his, ended his high school career by completing 14 of 24 passes for 252 yards and three touchdowns. He ran for another. It was named the game's offensive MVP. In two years, Canadian was 31 and 0. The Hall of Fame Football Player of the Year from Canadian High School, Tanner Schaefer. Congratulations, Tanner. In golf, you know, there are times when tournaments and, and meets and different sports are for second place. Such was the case last spring to determine the best 1A golfer in the state. Shelly Gold of Fort Elliott may not be a golfing prodigy, but she's pretty close. Fort Elliott, if you don't know, is a con consolidated school near Wheeler with 48 students in high school. And Shelley won the school's first ever UIL gold medal in any sport, and she made it look easy in doing so. At Lyons Municipal Golf Course in Austin, she shot a 78-76 for a two-round total of 154. Both rounds were the lowest of all 1A golfers, and as a result, Shelley won the 1A state title by seven strokes over Mark E. Kincaid of Blankets, and 19 strokes ahead of the bronze medalist. I know that I say that she's just a sophomore. At the regional tournament at the Reese Golf Course in Lubbock, it was more of the same. In a one round format shortened by weather, she shot a 70 to win by 10 strokes and earned her berth in as an individual to the state tournament. So to her coach, Robert Garcia, Shaley is an incredibly talented golfer. She is no stranger to success at all and she probably never will be. The Hall of Fame Golfer of the Year from Fort Elliott High School, Shaley Goad. Ready? Congratulations, great year for you. Thank you very much. In soccer, Lauren Piercy of Randall was certainly not overwhelmed by moving from high school to the Big 12. 
specifically to Baylor. In her first season with the Lady Bears, she was named the Big 12's Freshman of the Year. It was the first time Baylor had an end-of-the-year individual honor like that since the program was established in 1996. And Lauren was also second team all Big 12. She ended the regular season with 13 points and a team high six goals, which was fifth in the Big 12, and one assist. She had a four game, she had a four games of winning goals in 15 matches. Twice Lauren was named the Big 12 Newcomer of the Week, just the second time in Baylor's history for a player to earn that recognition twice in a season. The only other time was way back in 2001. You know, college soccer is in the fall and high school soccer is in the spring, so Lauren had two seasons, if you will, in 2015. And so last spring at Randall, while she was also running track, she was playing soccer, where she broke school marks for goals in a season and goals in a career, and she earned the Globe News Girls Overall Athlete of the Year honors. Well, she is at Baylor and could not be here, so accepting is Amberly Hawley for the Hall of Fame Soccer Athlete of the Year from Randall High School, now from Baylor, Lauren Piercy. In softball, Renee Irwin of West Texas A&M became simply one of the best softball players in NCAA Division II history. Start with the fact that the senior from Anna was the two-time National Player of the Year, only the second one to ever do that, and that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea. And if she was the National Player of the Year, it stands to reason that she was also the Lone Star Conference Player of the Year. And it's because of one of the best statistical seasons in Division II history. She hit 424 with nine doubles, three triples. She had 23 home runs, 71 RBIs, and set a conference record with 83 runs scored. Her slugging percentage was off the charts, and she made no errors as an outfielder. As WT finished with a 45 and 11 record, 13th in the country, and this was after winning the national championship in 2014. Renee set LSC career records with 62 home runs, 244 RBIs, and 265 runs scored. She good. A month ago, she signed to play with the Scrap Yard Dogs out of Woodlands in the National Professional Fast Pitch League. You know, softball was added to the Hall of Fame in 2014, and she has won both years. The 2015 Softball Player of the Year from West Texas A&M, Renee Irwin. In tennis, Madison Holting, she just didn't lose very many matches. Madison graduated from Tulia High School with a four-year record of 102 and five. And she got better with more experience. She was 55 and one over her last two years. 26 and one as a junior and 29 and 0 last year as a senior. In 2013 as a sophomore, she teamed with Carlos Sobaldia to win the state 3A mixed doubles title in College Station. As a junior, she and her brother Jackson finished third, and they're coached by their mother, Kim. And as she has probably done much of her life, mom got between her two kids, splitting them up, and it darn sure worked, because Jackson and Sobel Dia won state in boys' doubles, and Madison and sophomore Taylor Hooper won in mixed doubles. Working through three days of rain delays at the state tournament, Madison and Taylor had to play two matches, six sets in one day. After winning their semis, 6-1, 3-6, 6-4, the two came from behind to top a team from Brock in the finals. They lost the first set 2-6 and then came roaring back to win 6-1, 6-4. Madison is now playing volleyball and tennis at Seward County Community College in Liberal. 
and she's the Hall of Fame Tennis Player of the Year from Tulia High School, Madison Holting. In track, as you're about to hear, the bar is set pretty high at Canyon High School to be considered among the school's top hurdlers. These two co-athletes of the year have a, a lot in common. They're from Canyon, and they're very good at clearing obstacles in front of them and doing it in a hurry. First, Norman Grimes comes from a track family. His mother, Dee Dee, and sister, Katie, were very talented at Canyon and then on into college. And quite simply, Norman had one of the finest, maybe the finest year by a track athlete in panhandle history on the state, national, and international stage. Last year at about this time, he competed indoors where he had the top high school time in the nation in the 60 hurdles in 7.82 seconds. Transitioning to outdoors, Norman went on to win the state 5A 300 hurdles easily in 36.35 seconds. It's the fifth fastest high school time in the country and fastest at the state meet regardless of class. He might also have won the 110 hurdles had he not false started at regionals. Probably should mention too that he did all this despite having an appendectomy in the middle of the season. After the state meet at the U.S. Junior Nationals in or Eugene, Oregon, running against those two and three years older than him, he was second in the 400 hurdles and 50.59 and fourth in the 110 hurdles, 13.81. Then later in the summer, at the IAAF World Youth Championships in Cali, Colombia. He destroyed the field in the 400 hurdles, winning in 49.11 seconds, second fastest youth time in history. One of the top high school recruits in the country, Norman will head just 100 miles or so south to run for West Kitley and Texas Tech. And oh, did I say he did all of this last year as a junior. Says the senior this year, I, I like his chances in the Def Smith County Invitational in Hereford. I'll just say that. The Hall of Fame Co-Athlete of the Year in track from Canyon High School, Norman Grimes. You know, a lot of what Norman Grimes did sounds familiar to Michael Stigler, who won the state 300 hop title for Canyon back in 2011. Michael went on to run for the University of Kansas, where he became maybe the best 400 meter hurdler in Big 12 history. Michael won his fourth consecutive conference title in his specialty in May at Iowa State, winning in 49.67 seconds. That kind of consistency in the sport at that level is rare. And then Michael then went on to win the NCAA championships in Eugene, where he won in 48.64 seconds. Earlier in the year, Michael competed at the prestigious Texas Relays in Austin. Texas Relays has been around a long, long time. And Michael set the Texas Relay record in that event in winning in 48.44. At that time, it was the fastest in the world, and going into the fall was still number four in the world. And Michael would eventually finish fourth in the USA National Championships. This being an Olympic year, I have a feeling that someone has his sights set on the Olympic trials this summer. He's on the short list of the best ever track athletes from the Panhandle. Unfortunately, he could not be here today, so accepting Fort Canyon High School is softball coach Nicole Coffey. In volleyball, in the pipeline that flows from Amarillo High, outside hitter Emerson Solano was the latest in black and gold to distinguish herself on the court. The 5'8 senior led the Lady Sandys to a 36-8 record 
into the Class 6A regional semifinals. She was a force at the net, and the numbers bear that out. 392 kills, 25 blocks, 247 digs, 26 service aces. She was the District 2 6A MVP, a member of the Globe News Super Team, and was one of 25 players across the state to be named to the Texas Girls Coaches Association Class 6A All-State Team. A three-year varsity player, Emerson finished her high school career with 950 kills, 101 blocks, and 539 digs. Said Emerson, my teammates may be better because we worked so hard together. Accepting the award is the coach, her coach, Jan Barker, for the Hall of Fame Volleyball Player of the Year from Emerald High, Emerson Solano. In wrestling, it's just not hard to beat what Zach Diaz did at Boys Ranch on the mat last year. It's, it's impossible unless you wrestle in 42 matches. You see, Zach won the Class 5A title at 160 pounds and in the process went 41-0 and 0 to dominate his competition. In fact, his biggest competition came from a local wrestler. Randall's Bray Freeman, whom Zach beat both to win the regional title 3-1 and 5-3 in the state finals in Garland. Zach was one of four boys state champions from the area, but no one did it quite with the flair that he did. Said his coach Paul Jones, when opponents had 41 chances to knock off Zach, it's amazing to think that he went undefeated all year. The Hall of Fame co-wrestler of the year from Boys Ranch, Zach Diaz. It's very hard to distinguish between undefeated state champions, and so in this case, it was best not to. Felicity Bryant of Tascosa did what Zach Diaz of Boars Ranch did, win them all and win a state title. As a freshman in 2014, she was a state runner-up. Last year, she left nothing to chance in compiling a 39-0 record. In the state tournament at Garland, Felicity pinned her first two opponents, then faced Ashley McCutcheon of San Antonio Johnson, who owned a 37-1 record herself. Well, she won in a decision, 6-2, and then defeated Kayla DeLeon of Katie Cinco Ranch in the finals, 3-0. She got a nice jump start on the, to the season by winning the War of the Roses Lone Star Championships. And on the strength of her high school season, Felicity qualified for the USA Cadet World Wrestling Team, where she finished third nationally for Team Texas. Said her coach, Joe Stafford, she continually challenges herself and does things she needs to in preparation for those challenges. Everybody likes to win, but it seems like the champs and the ones that consistently win get a bit more out of it. Well, I think Felicity was in the regional tournament this weekend, could not be here, accepting as her mother, Tambra Sanchez, for the Hall of Fame Co-Wrestler of the Year from Tascosa High School, Felicity Bryant. The seal Well, actually, Felicity is a little better than that. She is in Sweden with Team USA, so pretty good. I can't believe she'd turn this down for that. Well, if you would, join me once again in recognizing our Hall of Fame Athletes of the Year for 2015. Now to present the C.L. Donovan Super Team Award is Hall of Fame board member and Globe News sports editor, Lance Lonard. The C.L. Donovan Jr. Super Team Award. The C.L. Donovan Jr. Super Team Award goes to a team that has been outstanding throughout the year. Mr. Donovan graduated from Amarillo High School in 1930, where he was a 117-pound halfback. He went to Texas Tech in 1931 and played quarterback and returned kickoffs. 
He also played on Texas Tech's first golf and tennis teams in 1931. Later, he boxed at the University of Arizona and had a tryout with baseball's St. Louis Cardinals. If you have only one line in the water, you're liable to catch only one fish. If you have several lines in the water, you're liable to catch several fish, Donovan once said in an interview with the Amarillo Globe News. Donovan was the only person to win the city championship in golf and tennis. He missed the city bowling championship by one pin. C.L. Donovan Jr. was named Panhandle Sports Hall of Fame Golfer of the Year in 1970 and served as director of the Tri-State Senior Golf Association for many years. And it's, uh, well, let's just get straight to the point on this one. Uh, Canadian High won the 2016 Class 2A Basketball State Championship, and in the 2016 Class 2A Division I State Football Championship. How many schools in the history of Texas have ever done that? Seven. So I would say they uh, deserve the Super Team of the Year. Andy Copley and his uh, Wildcat basketball team didn't get a hold of their first practice until after Christmas because they had won the previous state championship in football. So they played 22 games, went 21 and one, and, it, and I was down at the state tournament in San Antonio. They reached the final, gritty team, and they're playing Big Sandy, who everybody across Media Row gave them no chance, all the blogs, all the Twitter accounts, no chance at all. Who wins? Canadian, 68 to 60, go 21 and one, like I said, and are the state champion, first time in school history. Then this fall, Canadian comes on the field, and all they do is become one of the greatest small school football teams in the history of Texas. They go 16-0, running their record to 31-0 in their last 31 games, which ties the all-time record in Panhandle history with Stratford. So they will, their next game, they have a chance to become the all-time winningest school in Panhandle history. What they did going to 16-0 was simply the closest game they played was 31 points. They beat their playoff opponents by 223 points differential. Uh, and in the state championship game, they're down in Houston playing on an NFL field, nerves a little bit early. It ends up 61 to 20 over Refurio. Today, we are deeply honored with the Canadian Wildcats to be the CL Donovan Team of the Year, accepting our Coach Copley and Coach Chris Ketting of the Wildcats. Thank you, and as Lance mentioned, 21-1, and one, a funny story was when that game was over, uh, I was contacted by a reporter, and he asked, of course, about that, about that one loss. He said, did that propel you guys to the, to the state championship? I said, no, it just screwed up our record. But, <laughs> but uh, Coach Ketting, uh, we were contacted, and, and they said, you know, we had four minutes here together, two minutes apiece. Uh, to talk about our teams and so I quickly told coach Ketting I said just go ahead and take my four you're my boss my AD my mentor feel free and he quickly said you got three minutes and 45 seconds I'll take the last 15 uh, but it, this, it's a great honor there's several teams that could have been uh, named this team so we, we appreciate uh, that anytime you can stand up here and, and, and accept recognition for your team it's always a proud a proud moment. Six seniors uh, led by Braden Gall and Ethan Lusk and, and Tanner Schaefer and Cameron Copley. Those four kids really just wheeled our way to the championship and, and uh, so mentally tough, um, so physically tough. They just refused to lose and it was just a, a tremendous ride uh, that we take you know, so much pride in. But uh, humbly and, and very proudly, uh, we accept this award and, and thank everyone uh, so much. You, you left me more than 15 seconds. Uh, I'd, I'd like to thank the Panel Sports Hall of Fame, uh, Kids Inc. Uh, I'd like to thank the Globe News and Lance and all his crew. Nobody covers uh, high school sports like, the, like these guys do, and it's, it's, uh, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, you know, it's an honor to receive this award. Uh, you know, as coaches, we were extremely lucky to get to work with this group of kids that we got to work with. 
you know, it really, it's, really makes your job fun when you show up with a bunch of kids that, that get along with each other. They're great teammates. Uh, they show up and try and improve every day. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it makes, makes our job as coaches really special. Uh, these guys were under a lot of pressure this year. Um, you know, they, we, we had won a state championship in 2014. Had a lot of good kids coming back, so a lot of people were penciling us in there. You know, I had people coming up to me in the summer saying, uh, Coach, uh, hey, I got my, my uh, plane reservations and my rooms reserved there in Houston already, and that was back in the summer, and I'll just kind of shake my head because I think our kids know and our coaches know it's extremely hard to win a state championship. You have to have some things that, that really go your way, and, and to be quite honest, you have to have some luck in there too. And, and we had that too. Uh, but I'd really like to thank our community. We're accepting this award on, the, on the behalf of our community. We have a tremendous community in Canadian. Uh, the support they give us is un unbelievable. And uh, you know, our success wouldn't have been uh, possible without that. And I'd like to thank the Texas Panhandle as well. You know, I think the Texas Panhandle is a unique place. Um, you know, the, the, te the Panhandle people support each other. I can't tell you how many texts, emails, calls and things like that I got from people congratulating us and sure means a lot and, and uh, uh, Texas Panhandle sure is a special place but again thanks for this award and, and we're, we're truly honored and humbled about it so thank you very much. I think Coach Ketting this uh, maybe with some of these clinics can do a, a seminar on how not to run up the score. I mean, they'd be up 42 to nothing at the end of the first quarter and win like 55 to seven. And uh, I don't know how that happened, but uh, let me tell you, those scores could have been typographical errors had he so chosen. Now we move on to a group that has uh, sat here patiently, listening to all these athletes of the year, marveling to themselves how well they must listen how well they must take instruction, just how wonderfully coachable they must be. And this is a group our athletes of the year are thinking, you know, it's people like us that make you look pretty good. <laughs> it's the coaches of the year for 2015. In baseball in 2015, Brent Lyle had been at Booker by then 20 years. He said he likely would have left had the school not started a baseball program in 2004. Brent had played high school in Hooker, Oklahoma, and the Oklahoma Panhandle, and then on at Seward Community College in Kansas. Booker advanced to the regional quarterfinals in 2006, which is only the third year of the program, went through a bit of a drought, and then really burst through last spring. The Kiowas, under Coach Lyle, advanced to the 2A state tournament in Round Rock. They rode the pitching of Jared Reagan and Angel Ramirez, and the hitting of Coach Lyle's son, Hunter, as well as the bats of Reagan and Ramirez, to a 27-4 and record. In the postseason, they swept Abernathy in the area round and then run ruled Groover in the regional quarterfinals. In the regional semis, they lost their opening game to Miles 2-1, to one, saw their seniors graduate the next day, and then the following day won two games to win the series. And then for a berth in the state tournament, Booker swept Holly 7-6 and 10 to nothing. In the state semifinals, Booker fell to Flatonia 8-2 to to in an unprecedented season. The Hall of Fame Baseball Coach of the Year. From Booker High School, Brent Lyle. In basketball, uh, it's kind of a reoccurring theme this afternoon that uh, Canadian high school had a pretty decent uh, run of athletic success. You know, it's been an exceptional year when the school wins a state title in, in basketball, and you say, oh, yeah, I forgot all about that. Well, you've just heard about the Canadian basketball and, and football teams, but when you've done what they, they've done, some of it bears repeating. Basketball coach Andy Copley came to Canadian from Water Valley near San Angelo, where his team won the 1A state title in 2014. You win two state titles with two different teams and two different classes, you're a pretty good coach. On the heels of the football state champions, the Wildcats didn't have their first basketball practice 
a year ago until December the 27th, two days after Christmas. But Canadian is, is full of athletes, not just, not just football players. And so in a compressed season, Andy directed the Wildcats to 21 wins and 22 games, culminating by beating Big Sandy 68-60 to in San Antonio for the 2A state championship. Back-to-back -back for a coach in two different schools. Just the seventh school to win football and basketball titles in the same year, second ever, ever from the Panhandle, the Hall of Fame Basketball Coach of the Year from Canadian High School, Andy Copley. Well, in football, as a player and then a coach, Chris Ketting is pretty familiar with playing for state titles. He's been involved in, I think, about six of them. One as a player at Panhandle High School back in the 80s, three as an assistant coach at Canadian, and two as head coach. The 2015 Wildcats culminated possibly the most dominant season in Panhandle history with a 61 to 20 win over Refugio for the 2A state title and a winning streak of 31 games and counting. I think what Canadian has, though, is a program. They operate in a one-back, four-wide set with precision that you, you just don't see in the smaller classifications. A lot of times they simply out-scheme teams. And defensively, well, defense is sometimes overshadowed, but I think it's every bit as good as the offense. First with Kyle Lynch, who is now the Canadian superintendent, and now with Coach Ketting, they have a, I guess you'd say a wildcat way things they do to develop young athletes to take over when it's their time. Names change, but so often the execution and the final results do not. One reason is those names on the sidelines and their coaching sweatshirts, they seldom change. The leader of the best 2A football team in Texas, and for the second consecutive year, the Hall of Fame Football Coach of the Year from Canadian High School, Chris Ketting. In golf, happy coach Barry Stevens might have been tempted to look at his young team, which was a freshman, four sophomores, and a junior, and look to what they might accomplish in the next few years. And that still may be true, but boy, the present was pretty good too. Despite an extremely young team, Coach Stevens took the Cowboys to the cusp of the 1A state championship in pursuit of the school's first ever state title in any sport. Happy won the 1A regional, shortened to one round by, of in, by inclement weather. They won it easily by 19 strokes with a 346 total. Mitchell Downing was medalist with a 73, and teammate Sterling White was second with an 81. Then they go on to the state tournament in Austin at Lyons Municipal there, and Happy shot a two-day total of 682, 19 strokes behind senior Layden Throckmorton for second place. Mitchell Downing, state runner-up as a freshman in 2014, was again runner-up with a two-day total of 150. Other team members were Trevor Phillips, Carson Bryan, and Zach Flatt. Another thing you have to like about this group, versatility. You know, in a small school, you do a lot. And in the spring on this golf team, they had three regional track qualifiers, a state tennis qualifier, Three were in one act play, one was a champion calf roper, and amazingly enough, two were on the girls' golf team. I just threw that in. It's, they weren't on the girls' golf team. The coach who, who kept them all in point and focused toward Austin was the Hall of Fame Golf Coach of the Year from Happy High School, and that's Barry Stevens. In soccer, David Daly guided the Amarillo High boys soccer team to the best season by a Panhandle boys high school team ever in coming oh so close to a berth in the state tournament. The Sandys carried a 19-1-5 record into the 6A regional tournament in Midland, 
their third consecutive trip to the regional tournament. Already, goalkeeper Chance Judkins had 14 shutouts. In the regional semifinals, they defeated Flower Mound 3-1. to one. Goals by Ahmed Teodosic, Bobby Carlton, and Jaden Lemons helped put Amarillo High into the regional finals, the furthest advancement ever by an AISD team. With a berth in the state tournament on the line against Arlington Sam Houston, nothing was decided in regulation, nothing was decided in overtime, 100 minutes. In a shootout, Sam Houston prevailed 1-0 on a 4-2 edge in goals. The Sandys finished with a 22-5 record. Coach Daly has certainly built upon a strong club presence and has crafted year in, year out the best boys soccer program in West Texas. The Hall of Fame Soccer Coach of the Year from Emerald High, David Daly. Well, in softball, we're all familiar, familiar with the Canyon girls basketball team, but the Canyon girls softball team is starting to make some noise too. And they certainly did last year under second year coach Nicole Coffey. The Lady Eagles finished with a 32 and nine record, a perfect 10 and 0 record in district 3-5A play, and then disposed of Lubbock High, El Paso Bel Air, and Lubbock Cooper in the playoffs. That advanced Canyon to the regional semifinals against defending 5A state champion Alito, owners of a 44 game winning streak. It was a best of three series, and Canyon probably registered the biggest win for a panhandle team in UI softball history. They beat Alito in that first game two to one behind a uh, five, five hitter from uh, freshman, excuse me, a three hitter from freshman Kara Lear while Mackenzie Moore drove in both runs in the sixth inning with a triple. Alito, showing the championship medal that they have, came back to win games two and three, although very competitively, nine to six and 11 to eight, and then went on to win the 5A state title again. But the Canyon girls under Coach Coffey certainly came of age and proved that they can only play with the state's best, they can play with the nation's best, as Alito was ranked number seven nationally. The second year to honor the sport in this manner, the Hall of Fame Softball Coach of the Year from Canyon High School, Nicole Coffey. Well, in track, you've heard the saying, don't do as I do, do as I say. Well, Caprock boys track coach Del Cockrell can say, do as I say and do as I did. He was a former state champion in the 200 meters at Panhandle and later ran on a national champion 1600 meter relay team at Abilene Christian. And is proving to be just as good a coach as he was a sprinter. Caprock track for, for most of its history, to put it kindly, just wasn't very good. Oh, there was an occasional good individual, but as far as a team, you'd often find them at the bottom of the meet standings. But things have changed since Delt took over. First of all, the quality of athletes is much better, but he's been able to further that talent and bring out a lot of their potential. In 2015, the Longhorns did what had never been done in school history. In a year of firsts, Caprock won the Amarillo Relays, and then after that, put a, a remarkable streak together. They won the District 3-5A title. They won the Regional 5A area meet. And then they just had an exceptional performance in the Region 1-5A meet in Lubbock. Using six champions in six different events, Canyon easily won with 96 points, 32 more than runner-up Fort Worth Arlington Heights. It was printed in perspective, it was only the second regional title won by an Amarillo ISD boys team in the last 26 years, and only the third in more than 50. The Hall of Fame Track Coach of the Year from, Cam from Caprock High School, Delt Cockrell. <laughs> in 
In tennis, Kim Holting has, has put her stamp on the program at Tulia High School over the last several years, none more so than last year in 2015. You know, they say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. In this case, that's a good thing. Daughter Madison and son Jackson were one half of two state 3A doubles teams. Senior daughter Madison teamed with Tanner Hooper to win the state title in mixed doubles, and Jackson and Carlos Subaldea won in the boys' doubles. Last year, Coach Holting split apart Madison and Jackson, who had, to, who had played together the previous year in mixed doubles. I guess the great thing is, after she did that, she did not have to listen to some overprotective parent complain about it. Said Kim, it's hard watching as a coach, but harder watching as a mother. People gave me a hard time because I split my children up this year, but I felt doing that gave us a better chance, and it seemed to turn out, turn out okay. Yeah, I'd say it turned out okay. The Hall of Fame Tennis Coach of the Year from Tulia High School, Kim Holting. <laughs> In volleyball, you know, often you get better by playing good teams. And certainly Bushland and Coach Janine Udy know that. She has built a very strong Class 4A program at Bushland, one that won a state title in 2013, and one that just gets better by, by playing her neighbors. In 2015, the Lady Falcons lost six regular season matches all the local teams and higher classes. So when district play began, District 1 4A, Coach Udy, who's a former assistant at Emerald High, had Bushland ready to roll. The Lady Falcons, led by Anna Graham and Jayla Norman, would not lose a match until the state championship. The Lady Falcons, ranked number one for most of the season, hit their stride in October and November. They rolled through the playoffs, winning their first three matches without dropping a game. A regional title win over Decatur sent Bushland to the 4A state tournament. A semifinal victory over Columbus pitted the Lady Falcons against Argyle, where a young Bushland team frankly picked a bad time to have a bad match and lost in three games. Still, a 40-7 and record and a state runner-up season, hey, who wouldn't take that? The Hall of Fame volleyball coach for the second time in three years from Bushland High School, Janine Udy. Congratulations. Great season. Great season. Well, in wrestling, you know, if you coach long enough, you're going to have seasons when athletes quit for various reasons. At the start of the year in 2014-15, Dumas had four of them back, all experience, but they didn't, didn't return. And that's not what Coach Clint Chamblin planned, but it was next man up philosophy for the Demons, and boy, did they step up. Under Coach Chamblin, Dumas had its best season in at least 18 years, if not more. The Demons won the district title, and then won their first regional title since 1998 with 173 points, 32 more than runner-up Paladuro. Coach Chamblin took an area-high nine wrestlers to the state tournament in Garland. They would finish fourth in Class 5A with 90 and a half points, and two of his wrestlers, Martin Mendoza at 106 pounds and Randy Toledo at 126, won state championships. You know, the way this is structured, the Hall of Fame, we honor for the previous year, so sometimes this year sports are going. And just last night, Dumas came back and they won another regional title. But he's being honored for 2015 by turning what could have been a tough season into a very special one. The Hall of Fame Wrestling Coach of the Year from Dumas High School, Clint Chamblin. Show me, if you would, in recognizing our 10 Coaches of the Year for 2015.
Now we have the remainder of our special awards. Those include the uh, Leslie Nard Cazell Big Play Award, which will be presented by Hall of Fame committee member Phil Woodall. We'll follow that by the Special Achievement Awards, which will be presented by Lance Lonert and uh, Globe News sports writer and Hall of Fame committee member Terrence Hundley. Then the Dick Risen Hoover Award by Lance. Then finally the D. Henry Award by Phil. But first is the Leslie and Nard Cazell Big Play Award, and we'll have that introduction. The Leslie and Nard Cassell Big Play Memorial Award. The Leslie and Nard Cassell Big Play Memorial Award goes to an athlete who made an outstanding or crucial play during the year. Cassell was one of the founding fathers of competitive gymnastics and watched happily as the sport experienced a boom in popularity in recent years. Starting just after World War II, Cassell founded Nard's Gymnastics School in Amarillo and trained hundreds of future collegiate, national, and youth champions. He was one of the first coaches to train girls in the sport. In 1994, the United States Gymnastics Federation honored Nard Cassell with the organization's Lifetime Achievement Award. He was just the fifth person to be honored by the National Federation. Cassell graduated from Amarillo High School in 1933. Cassell had an interest in swimming and diving as a child. When he joined the Navy, he discovered a trampoline the Navy used in training and fell in love with tumbling and acrobatics. After the war, Cassell discovered children could get scholarships from tumbling and gymnastics and decided to coach. He soon developed a thriving school and coached many national trampoline and all-around gymnastics champions. I always remember for many years when Nard Cazell would present the Big Play Award, his brother Leslie had preceded him in death and they always called it the Memorial Award and Nard always pointed out, I'm not Leslie, he's dead. I'm Nard, I'm alive. So I just wanted to point that out on him. And I do have to correct John Mike Ballou because Jan Barker was having a heart attack back here. Emerson Solano was a junior, so she will be back next year. I just wanted to know that. And also one other thing, I predict that Canadian will not win the 2A state championship next year because they're going to 3A. So anyway, that's a little, all right. Big play award. February 27th, 2015, the Coliseum down in Snyder, regional semifinals. Wichita Falls, Ryder, and Canyon. Canyon, the defending state champions. And boy, it was a barn burner to start with. At the end of the first quarter, Canyon led five to four. Halftime, Canyon led 16 to 15. I'm getting excited. Third quarter, Canyon leads 30 to 27, but boy, they got going early in that fourth quarter. Lady Eagles led 34 to 27, but alas, Wichita Falls, Ryder comes back makes it 39-38 with a buck 20 to go. And they tie it up at 41 all to force overtime. Well, it got tied up by Ryder, 46 all with under a minute to go in overtime. Canyon brings the ball up. They call a timeout and Joe Lombard calls a wonderful play. Actually it didn't go the way they thought, but I think it went another way. They call a timeout with 10 seconds left and they called on a fine player, Caitlin Cunyas. Let's go to the videotape. And there it is. A couple of defenders on her, and she sinks a 14-foot J at the buzzer to win an overtime 48-46 over Wichita Falls Ryder. They advanced to the regional final and beat my wife's alma mater, Fort Worth Trimble Tech, and she could care less anyway, and they go on to their second consecutive state championship. The Leslie and Nard Cazell Memorial Big Play Award goes to Caitlin Cunyas of Canyon High School. <laughs> Um, I would just uh, like to start by giving a huge thanks to uh, our coaching staff at Canyon High. You know, Coach Lombard uh, thinks of every possible scenario to uh, put us through, um, all the little last-second plays he draws up and all the, you know, a minute-left scenarios he gives us. And so it's almost as if um, we had practiced that several times, several. So um, I would just... A uh, huge shout out to uh, my parents that 
cart me to the endless um, AAU games that prepared me to this and uh, buying the candy bars in between games when you're playing five games. You know, it all just leads up to these huge moments and I'm just so blessed to play at Canyon High where I just have unselfish teammates and um, just play for the best coach in the world. Thank you. And one other thing on Caitlin, she had a little injury earlier in the year. And uh, by the way, the Lady Eagles will be on their quest for their third consecutive state championship Monday night, 6 o'clock, down at Hutcherson Center in Plainview, right? Against Lubbock High. Caitlin Cunyas. Terrence and I are here to give the Special Achievement Awards. Uh, T and I uh, get a front row seat to uh, see you guys do your uh, thing, and it's, uh, it's really kind of cool, isn't it, Terrence, that, uh, that we get that opportunity. Yeah, it's always great, especially whenever you get to watch a freshman grow up through the four years and see kind of what they become as seniors. And uh, I would be remiss with all the Canadian love today. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of players out there, and we would like you guys to stand up today and be applauded. Anybody here? Canadian? No? <laughs> okay. All right. Missed that one, didn't I? You blame that on T. No, here we go. Uh, and then uh, also, I'm, I'm starting off with the uh, Memphis golf team. And if, if, if any of those young ladies are out there, uh, please stand up. So when you drive down 287 and approach the town of Memphis, two things are guaranteed if your car windows roll down. On a Friday night, the football field is so close to the road, you may get one in the head on an extra point. In the spring, you will never hear the Memphis girls golf team shout out, four missed fairways just don't exist with the tradition-rich Memphis girls golf team. And that was certainly the case last April. Memphis dominated the Class 2A state golf meet, winning by 39 strokes over a district rival, Wellington. The title was its fourth state title in the last eight years and the third in the last four years. That is truly what you call a dynasty. Coach Landon Wesley's team was led by a runner-up finish of Casey Monzingo, and she came oh so close to being a state champion, losing in a playoff. Wesley, who coaches in Temple now, said any time you win a state championship, there's something special about that team. And you remember it for the rest of your life. They, they just showed a lot of dedication. Please help me in welcoming one of the four 2015 Panhandle Sports Hall of Fame Special Achievement winners, the Memphis girls golf team accepting is Dick Hutcherson. If there's one word that could describe Emily Hilbush of River Road, it's inspirational. She's been nothing short of an insp inspiration since she's been uh, participating in athletics. Uh, Hilbush became the first wheelchair athlete from Amarillo to ink a Division I athletic scholarship last April, signing to play wheelchair basketball for the University of Texas in Arlington. A month later, in May, she made more history at the UIL Class 3A state track meet uh, as she put her name in the Texas Panhandle record books, becoming the first wheelchair athlete to win the gold in the 100 and 400 meter dash in Austin. Hilbush finished with a time of 1.22.56 in the 400 and clocked a 21.14 seconds in the 100 meter. Hilbush has just been a tremendous athlete for River Road and please help me in welcoming another member of the, uh, sorry, uh, another Special Achievement Award winner, uh, Emily Hilbush, who's except her mom Stephanie is accepting on her behalf. Last fall, Jamin Kelly of Boys Ranch finished in the top five of the District 3 2A cross country meet, and he was 26 at the Region 1-2A meet in Lubbock. Certainly, 
terrific accomplishments for any athlete. But there were several Texas Panhandle runners finishing better in both those meets. However, none of those were, in, were as inspiring as what Jamin did. Jamin was born legally blind. He basically has no vision. And what he does see from any distance is like you looking through a tunnel, but it's blurry. Yet, when this young man arrived at Boyd's Ranch, he decided he wanted to run cross country and wrestle his sophomore season. Boyd's Ranch cross country coach Kenneth Brown found out about Jamin's lack of sight that sophomore year when one of his best runners was having kind of an off season and not running his top times. The deal is that's because the runner was hanging back with Jamin and guiding him through the course so he wouldn't trip and fall. Also that year he wrestled and made the regionals with, and, and, the reason, and the only time he would know that he won because he couldn't see the scoreboard is once his hand was raised. Remarkable young man. Boys Ranch School colors, it gets better, blue are blue and yellow. So Coach Brown, the cross country team, kind of upped the idea of the brightness of the yellow on their running singlets so Jamin could look ahead and know where to go following the blurry yellow. However, Jamin missed his junior year with a detached retina in quote unquote his good eye. But there he was last fall, being named team captain, finishing fifth in district and then 26th out of 133 runners at regionals. Coach Brown said Jamin might be blind by age 30. Yet, he's the first to joke about it. He's so positive, I've never seen that kid have a bad day. Jamin, Jamin also gets it done in the classroom. He's already been accepted to Texas Tech. So what Jamin proves is over and over every day, just because you don't finish first doesn't mean you aren't an inspiring winner. Please help me in welcoming one of the four 2015 Panhandle Sports Hall of Fame Special Achievement Award winners, Boys Ranch Cross Country star, Jamin Kelly. Our uh, final Special Achievement Award get winner uh, is none other than Hassan Abdi of Paladero and South Plain College. Abdi has been running for several years, and this year was once again a, a great season for him. Abdi was part of the South Plains College men's half marathon team that has won back-to-back -back NHJC AA half marathon national championships. Abdi earned All-American honors after he finished first overall in the men's division with a final time of one, uh, one hour, four minutes, uh, 55 seconds. It was eight seconds ahead of second place. The sophomore runner also finished fifth at the NC, NJCAA Division I National Cross Country Championships with a time of 2458.5, a little over one minute behind first place. Accepting on Abdi's behalf would be Coach Tom James. Please help me uh, in welcoming uh, Special Achievement Award winner Hassan Abdi. <laughs> The Dick Reisenhoover Award. Dick Reisenhoover was born in Childress, lived most of his early years at Center, a community east of Childress. Dick played freshman basketball at the University of Texas and then went into the service where he coached and played on the baseball team. Returning to the University of Texas, he played on the 1950 Longhorn National Championship baseball team. Dick returned to Childress in 1950 to teach and coach and became the head basketball coach in 1954. Under his guidance, Childress won the district basketball championship six of the next seven years. In 1957, Dick moved to Amarillo and worked at KGNC Radio and Television, where he became the voice of the Amarillo Gold Sox and served as color man for Warren Hassey on West Texas State University football games. Dick moved to Dallas in 1970 and right away started Super Bowl coverage with the Dallas Cowboys, doing some preseason Cowboy games and the Texas-Oklahoma TV game one year. Later, when the Texas Rangers moved to the Dallas-Fort Worth area, he did the TV game the first year, then went on to the network where he became the voice of the Texas Rangers. 
1974, Dick Reisenhofer became the 31st honoree and the first sportscaster installed in the Panhandle Sports Hall of Fame. Dick died of cancer on opening day for the Texas Rangers in 1978. And this year's uh, Reisenhofer winner doesn't call out his own play-by-play -play while coaching basketball like the young Reisenhofer did when in his children's days. He would sit a, a radio or a recorder next to him and during his own basketball games uh, would do the play-by-play. -play. So uh, that, that's kind of how he got started. But this year's winner does live up to the impressive list of past winners, which include 1974 American League Rookie of the Year and former big league manager Mike Hargrove of Perryton. Super Bowl champions Kenny King of Clarendon and John Ayers of Canyon. You have Olympic wrestling gold medalist Brandon Slay of Tascosa, and currently on the PGA Tour uh, is Ryan Palmer of Amarillo High. And yes, he certainly lives up to the past winners because he is one of the rare who have been honored twice with the Ryzen Hoover. This time Mike Scroggins did it at age 50 and was called a rookie. Scroggins entered 2015 already only already Really, he is the greatest bowler in Texas Panhandle history. The smooth throwing lefty owned eight, owns eight PBI titles, including the Masters and U.S. Open championships. But a number every one of us out there who can, can really relate to, since we've all been bowling, is the man has 42 perfect 300 games in PBA competition. Mike also entered uh, 2015 coming off a really bad foot injury and he wasn't even sure he could really get through a pro tournament, let alone go for the whole year. Well, he won the first PBA 50 Tour title, bowling against some of the best in the world, tagged on two more Ws, and was named the PBA Tour 50 Rookie of the Year. Here, national publicity from places all over was even on ESPN Sports Center. Mike lives in Amarillo, and I personally know him a bit, and you will not meet a more humble, man despite all his national accomplishments. Mike does have a second title next to pro bowler, Randall High Bowling Coach. Think about that for a second. That's like Tony Romo deciding next fall to show up with Coach Ketting at Canadian and say, hey, I'm gonna volunteer to be the quarterback coach. He's that humble and wants to help youth. And he told me personally, one of his greatest joys in life right now is seeing a young bowler who doesn't have any clue what's going on when they're a freshman become a 200 bowler by the time they're a senior. Mike was out of town when the call came to his house saying he had joined Canyon High girls basketball coach, coaching legend Joe Lombard, who I think is here in the house, pro golfer Palmer, who I just talked about, and, and then Brandon Slay, Olympic gold medalist. They are the elite class of the only two-time Ryzen Hoover winners. His wife called to tell him of the award. His response, are you sure it's me? Oh yeah, we're sure. Please help me in welcoming the 2015 Panhandle Sports Hall of Fame Dick Reisenhoover Award winner, Pro Bowler Mike Scroggins. Thank you, Lance, for that uh, great introduction. First, I'd like to thank uh, Kids Inc for honoring me with this uh, prestigious award again. And also I'd like to congratulate all the inductees this year. Congratulations. Uh, I wouldn't be up here today if it wasn't for the support of my family out here. So I'd really like to thank them right now. Um, my parents, Kay and Eddie Scroggins, they, uh, they introduced me to bowling in the late 1970s when Bowling wasn't real popular back then, and, uh, but I'm glad you, you guys did because it changed my whole life. Thank you very much. And then my family, Melanie, my wife of 21 and a half years, happy Valentine's Day, by the way, and, uh, and my son, Ross Scroggins, he's, uh, he's attending West Texas A&M, and he's actually bowling for my brother, down at, he's the coach at uh, West Texas A&M, and I believe they're ranked in the top 10 in bowling this year, so. And then my uh, son, Will Scroggins, he bowls for me at Randall. And then uh, my daughter, Maggie, she's, she's a couple of years uh, from Randall. I hope she's playing.
plan on bowling, but she likes tennis too, so if she, she goes tennis, I'll, I'll forgive her for that. But uh, the last person I'd like to thank is myself for never giving up on the dream I had as a uh, little kid growing up in the Texas Panhandle of becoming a uh, professional bowler. And I had a lot of people on the way through all the years told me that, you know, a bowler from the Texas Panhandle would never be able to compete against the uh, greatest bowlers in the world on the professional bowlers tour. Well, I'm proud of the fact that I proved them wrong and uh, I put Amarillo, Texas on the map of the bowling world. Thank you. The D. Henry Memorial Award. The D. Henry Memorial Award goes to an athlete who overcomes adversity with class, heart, and determination during the year. D. Henry was an Amarillo native and graduate of West Texas State University. He was known for his career as a coach and a teacher. At one time, D. was the head coach at Canadian High School. Additionally, he taught for six years in Amarillo at Stephen F. Austin Junior High School. He was also a very popular summer baseball coach. D was stricken by cancer, which caused one of his legs to be amputated. Near the end of his life, he was the YMCA's baseball coach. Despite his battle with cancer, he continued to coach the team from his bed because he was too ill to make it to the field. His parents and students presented him with a 14-inch television for entertainment and $348 in cash during his bedridden days. D. Henry died in 1960 at the young age of 39. This is always one of the most inspirational moments of the Texas Panhandle Sports Hall of Fame. Let me give you a date. September 20th of 2012. That's what, almost three and a half years ago. There was a young sophomore at Spearman High School, 5'9", 145 pounds, played quarterback, defensive back. And uh, Spearman was off to a nice 4-0 start, and they were going to have a bonfire prior to the next game heading over to Sunray to play. By the way, they did win that game 21 to 15. But on that Thursday, they were going to have that bonfire at Spearman. Well, they poured some gasoline on the fire. And this young man said, I said, yeah, I'll light it. And right after he lit the lighter, it was click. And then everything went red. What happened is this young man from Spearman received second and third degree burns, went up to third degree burns to 40% of his body, went to Spearman initially, a hospital there, and then transferred down to the University Medical Center down in Lubbock to the burn unit. And his burns were to the face, arms, and hands, and this occurred during that explosion while lighting the bonfire. His family asked for prayers. Candy Wolf, his mom, said, God is already at work. Well, he made it back. He spent six weeks down in Lubbock, had skin grafts. And I hate to even say this one. When I read it out of the newspaper deal, they were peeling skin to help his burns heal. That even hurts to even say it. But, yeah, he made it back. He didn't play the rest of 2012. He was a sophomore. 2013, yeah, he started running track again. And uh, played a little uh, football, especially in 2014. This young man, there were three guys that gained over a thousand yards at Spearman that year on the ground. Cameron Wolf gained 1,113 yards and was a standout free safety. In fact, he was named All-State, had 56 tackles and two picks during that season. Coach Steve Rodman said, you know, he can't really feel the football, so he has to really tuck it when he runs, and tuck it he did. He also played in the 2015 Greenbelt Bowl in Childress. He was the North Team Outstanding Defensive Back in their win, 32-23 to over the South, 13 tackles, and he intercepted his fellow Spearman Lynx quarterback who was on the other team, Tanner Baird. Now, also in 2014, let's go back a little bit, he won the state championship in 300 meter, meter hurdles down in Austin with his best ever time that time of 38.8, 38.38. And then the next year in the 2A uh, boys state tournament, he finished silver with a time of 38.37.
He's also qualified before in 110 meter hurdles, of course, 300 meter hurdles, and also the long jump. So this young man has come back a long way from what he suffered. He did have one bit of advice for you. Don't play with gas. Ladies and gentlemen, our 2016 D. Henry Memorial Award goes to Spearman track and football athlete Cameron Wolf. Uh, I would just like to thank the Panhandle and my community for all the support. Um, coming from a small town, you really don't, I mean, you don't see what everyone does for you until something happens. And, um, you know, the whole Panhandle really came together, even, you know, teams, rival teams, everything. They, uh, I'm just really grateful to be from the Panhandle. Thank you. Now, we told you how painful it was. One other thing I forgot to mention, during the time he was playing the football, he had to wear a thick sweater under his uniform to keep playing. Another nice hand for Cameron Wolf. Well, now to the signature portion of today's ceremonies, and that's the addition of the newest class of four to the previous 166 into the Texas Panhandle Sports Hall of Fame. There's something unique about the Panhandle, and if you've lived here for any length of time, you know that. Maybe it's the location. Maybe it's because we're often an afterthought to the bigger populations downstate. Maybe it's because we have to fight a lot harder for what we deserve. But there's a, a, a togetherness, a sense of oneness, of unity that exists here that's, that's hard to find in most regions. You know, in sports, we have some bitter rivalries. We fight each other like cats and dogs on the field or on the court, on the mat. And until we take on outsiders, and then it's all for one. That's never more apparent in the high school playoffs when there's only a few teams left and every town feels like then it's their own. Canadian this fall may have been the most adopted town in the Panhandle. You know, there, there's a fierce pride here, perhaps born of where we are. But when an athlete or coach excels beyond our borders or within over a period of time, they no longer have hometowns. They're just from here. They're part of us, and their success is our success, and their heartbreak can be our heartbreak. And in a simple but sincere way today, as is done every second Sunday in February, we honor them the best way we can. Really, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for all you've done. Thank you for making us proud of the Panhandle. Thanks for calling it home. You know, all of today's inductees at one time or another have been around more elaborate fanfare. Maybe they've been in more exciting locales, played in or had their teams play in front of bigger crowds or brighter spotlights. This is not all that extravagant or elaborate because it's not us. But if we're not, it's not because we don't see this as any less important. It's just that we don't need all the frills. We're down to earth and simple and so are our ceremonies. You know, when a person becomes a stranger in his hometown, something sad has happened. Someone has turned their back on the other. The past is forgotten and roots are pulled up and thrown away and part of him is gone, never to return. But on the other hand, I can think of, of no better honor than from those where you grew up, where your career started, where it continued for as long as it could. It's a place where you learn to carry the football, 
and in some racially tense times saw friends and teammates for who they were, not what they looked like. It's a place where they told you how good an athlete your mother was, and you set out to be as good as her and ended up being better. It's a place where you coached in your hometown, set exacting standards for your players, and took them year after year to be among the state's best. It's a place where you learn the game of basketball, excelling while playing for one of the best coaches in Panhandle history and then one of the best in NCAA history. You know, to be honored by your hometown says a lot about you as an athlete and coach, but it says so much about you as a person. So let's get to it and install the 58th class into the Panhandle Sports Hall of Fame. You know, when Alamo Catholic High School dropped football in the early 1970s, that became a bit of an issue for a young freshman named James Mayberry. You see, he was pretty good at football. He loved the sport. In discussion with his parents, James transferred to public school and to the new attendance zone of Tascosa as a sophomore in 1972. He was in high school at a time, changing time, racial tension new boundaries, people thrown in there together. But James, with his easygoing demeanor, was a model for fellow students to follow. About the only ones who didn't like James were the poor defensive backs on the scout team that he would run over during practice. Tascosa coaches were all unanimous about one thing. James Mayberry loved to practice. He loved games, too, and he should. At about 190 pounds, he was quick, fast, strong. He had a knack of when to spin in and out of tackles, things that you just can't coach. As a junior and senior, 1973 and 74, he gained more than 1,200 yards each, each year. And in the rivalry that is Tascosa Amarillo High, he probably had still the single best individual performance in that long series. In a 34-7 win over the Sandys in November 1974, James had 347 yards of total offense. It went like this. He scored four touchdowns, kicked four extra points, rushed for 133 yards, caught two passes for 124 yards, returned a kickoff 90 yards for a touchdown, and oddly enough, sold 14 boxes of popcorn at halftime. Coach colleges from all over wanted him. I mean, Southwest Conference, the old Southwest Conference, the old Big, Big Eight. But a panhandle product here, he hadn't seen much of the way of mountains. And he fell in love with Boulder, Colorado. And he signed with the Colorado Buffaloes. A piece of heaven, that was Colorado, James said. And by the time he left after the 1978 season, James Mayberry had one of the finest careers ever for a CU running back. He finished as their number two all-time leading rusher with 2,550 yards, and each year the Buffs finished in the nation's top 25. Nearly 40 years later, that yardage is 10th all-time, and there have been a lot of good running backs play for CU. His junior year, 1977, was his best. As about a 200-pounder, he gained 1,299 yards and had seven 100-yard games. He had a school record 40 carries against Kansas State and gained 250 yards against Oklahoma State. James was taken to the third round of the 1979 NFL Draft by the Atlanta Falcons. He played with the Falcons for three seasons, primarily as a special teams player and reserve running back, and when gained 347 yards in the NFL. His claim to fame was a rookie in 1979. In an overtime game against the New Orleans Saints, he was on the punt receive team. An errant snap went over the Saints punt, punter's head. Punter went back, retrieved the ball, threw an ill-advised pass. James intercepted it, being overtime, took it in for the winning touchdown. He said at the time, all I could think about was, I sure hope everyone in Amarillo saw me. James, we probably got the Cowboys, and that was before NFL Sunday tickets, so we probably didn't. You know, after his playing days, 
this father of five and, and grandfather of four has been at various times a Potter County juvenile detention officer, correction officer at the Clements Unit, and, and a job now that he has that I think is really almost a calling. He's a care provider for mentally handicapped adults. But he's the finest running back to ever come out of the city of Amarillo, and he's the 167th member of the Panhandle Sports Hall of Fame, Mr. James Mayberry. Congratulations, my friend. Great job. You've earned this, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for that, that applause. It's the first standing ovation I've had. Yeah, I, it's nice. But I want to give thanks and glory to God for which all things are possible and um, for blessing me on receiving this award. I'd like to thank the Panel of Sports Hall of Fame Committee, Kids Incorporated, and Emerald Globe News. Also, I would like to thank my Kids Incorporated coaches. They're now here. They're up in heaven, Mr. Carter and Sergeant Knuckles. They're the one that started the ball rolling. I also would like to thank my coaches, Coach Greenhouse, Coach Reynolds, Coach Hicks, Father Bloom, Father D, Father Nichols. <laughs> uh, at Alamo, Coach Hyatt, Coach Cal, Coach Harris, Coach Huey, Coach Dawson, Coach Allen and Coach Hurd, and Coach Canfield and the coaching staff of the University of Colorado, who gave me the opportunity to play the game that I really love. And all these men inspired me and pushed me and encouraged me to be the best on and off the field. And also, I would like to accept this award on behalf of my teammates at Kids Incorporated, Alamo and Tascosa, and also the University of Colorado, Atlanta Falcons, and the Washington Federals, the pro teams that I played for. Without those guys, I wouldn't even be here, you know, blocking for me and protecting me while I was on the field. I also accept this honor for the class of 1975 at Tascosa High. We went through a lot during those years, and the best thing that came out of it is that we became friends, and we still are. And I also want to thank my brothers, Dwight, <laughs> Alan, <laughs> and Charles, who put up with me for all those years in my 1970 music, my red Volkswagen, <laughs> and my past girlfriends. <laughs> but most of all, I also would like to thank uh, Mike Higgins, Richard Fefferman, Keith Graves, Danny Ross, for not letting these guys forget about me and the achievement that I have made. And I also want to thank Mr. Jerry Felferman for contacting the University of Colorado, who would offered me a scholarship for four years. Without him, I would have never even known about Colorado. Also, last but not least, I'd like to give thanks to my mom and to my dad. They made it comfortable for us to achieve our goals and our dreams. Color was never an issue at our house. Mom always said, you know, hey, respect everyone, fear no one. Always do your best. And Dad said, hey, <laughs> if he hit you, hit him back. So, <laughs> so they are the reason why I'm here and been inducted in the Hall of Fame. They're my Hall of Fame. Thanks, Mom. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Panel of Sports Hall of Fame, the committee, Amarillo, and all my friends out there. I love you. Hopefully, I get the chance to see you. And thank you again. Oh, another thing, happy Valentine's Day. James just said he'll give you two more minutes to quit, and then that, that's it. 
Congratulations, James. You know, the year was 1988, and Jack Wilson was named the volleyball coach at Dumas. Jack had been the head girls track coach in the early 80s, and at one time was an assistant basketball coach. This time he'd been primarily a junior high coach when he was promoted. He took the volleyball position, but what he really wanted was the girls' basketball job if, if P.D. Fletcher, the head coach, would ever retire. Well, they didn't do too badly that first year. They won the 4A state championship. And they won it again in 1989, and they won it again in 1990. And Jack's words then were, man, I think I'm going to stick to volleyball. Well, when something's working, why change? Over the next quarter century, 24 years to be exact, Jack Wilson excelled in what was primarily the women's coaching world of Tes Texas high school volleyball. You know, if there's a holy grail of high school volleyball coaching in the panhandle, it belongs to Amarillo High's Jan Barker, Herford's Brenda Kitten, and to Jack Wilson. In his 24 years upon retirement in 2012, his teams compiled a record of 713 and 211 won five state championships, those three in a row from 88 through 90, and again in 1998 and 2006. His teams made nine state tournament appearances and 15 times went to the regional tournament. All of this from a coach who was pretty unfamiliar with the sport until the program started in 1982 and he was coaching in junior high in his hometown of Dumas. He talked to other coaches, he bought manuals, he did what he could to get up to speed on the sport. She said, even in 1988, I'd be embarrassed to tell you the fundamentals I showed the girls. I was not a technique coach. My strength was motivation and getting the most out of the girls. Oh, well, Jack was proficient in strategy and fundamentals soon enough, but his strength was bringing the talent out of his teams. His girls had talent as Dumas built a volleyball tradition, but he got the maximum out of that talent. He coerced the best out of them, and at all times, he didn't, didn't suffer through half efforts. If he did, it wasn't for long. A lackluster practice would come to a halt where he'd tell them, we're going to do something. Right now, we're either going to bear walk, we're going to crab walk, we're going to run, or we're going to practice volleyball. And if we're going to practice volleyball, we're going to be, in his words, relentless. You know, their matches with district rival Hereford through the years were epic. Each outstanding program pushing the other. It's kind of like Duke, North Carolina basketball. The two programs combined for 10 state championships and 17 state tournament appearances. Their district matches, and often they would play in the regional finals, packed gyms. Phenomenal, Jack called the rivalry. For 15 years in a row, one of them went to state. In 1996, Herford's breakthrough year, Dumas had beaten them four times that year. But the fifth time is in the regional finals and a berth on the line to go to the state tournament. Well, Herford won, and as a parting gift, the Herford fans sang to Wilson, Hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back no more. You know, they're real clever over there in Hereford. Well, Jack didn't hit the road, winning a state title two years later and a final one in 2006. Yet he did hit the retirement road in 2012, culminating a remarkable career, even if he never got to be basketball coach. One of the Panhandle's top volleyball coaches, one of the state's top volleyball coaches in doing all in his hometown from Dumas, the 168th member of the Panhandle Sports Hall of Fame, Mr. Jack Wilson. Jack, congratulations, my friend. Great job. Outstanding career. It's all yours. Again, I want to thank the Panhandle Sports Hall of Fame. This is such a great honor. Some, you know, when you first receive this or you hear about this, I just think, you know, I'm not really worthy. You know, I, I'm, I'm just not. There were so many other people involved in this that uh, were a huge part of this. And uh, here I am, you know, taking the spotlight. Uh, number one, 
my wife, she was uh, my number one supporter, stat keeper, uh, psychiatrist, the whole works. Uh, my coaching heroes and always, and they were both Dumas people all through and through, Don Phillips, junior high boys coach, who always just loved to watch him coach. He was such a motivator. And Petey Fletcher, girls basketball coach, who was just a phenomenal basketball coach, and I just loved the way he got it out of the kids. Um, one of my longtime assistant coaches, best coach I'd ever coached with, uh, Ruth Ann Vessels, uh, Julie Williams, girl that had played for me, come back to Dumas, um, started coaching in junior high, then was my assistant, and now is the head coach at Dumas and continuing the volleyball legacy at Dumas High School. Um, also, Kyler Johnson, Dolly Johnson, Bill Copeland, also great supporters of mine, and uh, always been appreciated. And also the, all the administration, but especially my athletic directors, uh, Bruce Land, who hired me, uh, Brent McCauley, Brian Heaton, were always so supportive, just so appreciative, all those things. When you start looking back, I reflected when they started talking to me about this and just started reflecting back on all the things, the highs and lows, the roller coaster ride of coaching uh, girls volleyball. And I had two basic lows in my career in 92 when we were, um, we'd beat Hereford four years previous, all in close, close games in the regional finals. Played them again for the fifth time, or the fourth time in a row in the regional finals in 92. Had beat them four times, two times in preseason, two times in district play. And then in the regional finals, we play them and they beat us. Devastating. I couldn't sleep for a month. It was devastating. And then in 96, we were playing again for the regional finals. It was an important game for me because my daughter was a senior. She had started for me three years. And we, were, we had a great team that year. We, Herford and us were both ranked one and two or three all year long. And we knew it was going to be us and Herford in the regional finals. We had split in the district that year. And we knew it was going to be tough. We beat them the first game in the regional finals. Then they beat us the last two. Devastating. Then, right afterwards, again, as he just said, uh, the entire crowd, standing room only, at Tascosa Gym, you know, just started singing, hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back no more. I know that song by heart now. <laughs> and I can sing it on key unlike them. <clears throat> Highs were my first year of coaching high school volleyball in 88. Didn't know much about the sport. Uh, I'd been, always wanted to be a basketball coach. Come in, and uh, the first of the year, we're 10 and 9 coming into the district. Uh, it just got beat by a JV team in a tournament to start district. Not feeling very good about our prospects for the year, although I'd coached them in 7th, 8th, and ninth grades and knew they had talent, and I knew I wasn't doing very good. But eventually, you know, you just let the cream come to the top, get out of the way and quit coaching and let the girls do it, and it, which is what I did. And uh, they come on and went undefeated all through district. And then we get into the playoffs, and we never won a playoff game at Dumas. We've only been in the playoffs one time and got beat the first game. But we would never won anything, so we weren't expecting anything. Certainly wasn't scouting the next team. And we win that first game. Then we win the second game. Then we win the third game. Then we win the fourth game. And I'm going, just unbelievable. These are miracles. Then we win the state championship. And I'm going, this is pretty easy. I just get out of the way and let the girls play, and we're going to kick some butt. And that was pretty much my philosophy from then on, was just get out of the way and let the girls play. Um, my basic philosophy all the way through my coaching career was at the first of the season, you guys just aren't very good. We got a long ways to go. By the midseason, no matter what, whether they were there or not, I was saying, you guys are pretty good. We're starting to get the hang of this. By the playoffs, I was going, regardless of how they were playing, I would go, you guys are phenomenal. Nobody can touch you. We're going to win it all. And every year, you lied to them. No matter what, you lied to them. You tell them they're good, and they'll believe it. And it's amazing, coaches, they believe what you tell them. 
and they believed me, and we always had success. Um, it was a wonderful, wonderful career. Again, I'm just so grateful for this honor. Uh, thank everybody involved. Really appreciate it. It's way over my head. Uh, never thought anything like it would hap happen to me. Um, I'm going to cherish it the rest of my life. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Jack. Very well done. You know, if I understand the story correctly, it's not much of a stretch to say that if Heather Merle hadn't got sick as a freshman at Spearman in 1986, she might not have accomplished the unprecedented in Panhandle sports, might not even be sitting up here this afternoon. You know, in track, she was a hurdler and, and running the 200 meters as a freshman trying to emulate what her mother, Judith Logston, did as an outstanding athlete in the early 1970s in Groover. But she got sick there for about three weeks, and her coach figured she'd miss some valuable, you know, practice time in the hurdles. Already running a 400-meter leg on the mile relay, right before the district meet, he put Heather in the 400. Now, if you know anything about that, that's one lap around as fast as you can go. And so, it's not exactly a nice way to treat a girl coming off a of sickness. The first 400 she ever ran was at that meet, in the district meet. And she won. And then she won at regional. And so now she's at state. She's at the state meet at Austin, one that was delayed hours and hours by weather. Running late in the evening, she was a, way out in lane eight. And if you looked at all the regional times, she had the slowest of the eight runners coming in. But she said, you know that term, running scared? Well, that was me. Out in lane eight, there was nobody around me, and I thought I'd jump the gun. Not in a million years did I think I'd win that race. Well, Heather would cut two seconds off of her best, and that, that just doesn't happen at that level, but it did. And she won in 58.1 seconds, one state. And that would become a trend. She would return as a sophomore to win state, this time in a faster 55.9 seconds, two in a row. As a junior, she was in the shape of her life because she said of all the uh, suicides that she had to run at the end of basketball practice, all because of a little, shall we say, misunderstanding with her coach. And that translated to even a better time of 55.4 to win her third 2A 400 meters in a row, which was the second fastest time ever run by an area girl. Heather followed that as a senior in 1989, completing a 400 sweep with a winning time of 55.8. In addition, she was third as a junior and senior at state in the 100 hurdles. But the sweep in the 400 is what set her apart. She is still among only a handful in the state of Texas in any class to win four state titles in the same event. She was the first from the Panhandle and still only the second from the Panhandle to ever do that. And those times, well, if you put those in last year's race, nearly 30 years later, three of them would be good enough to still win in 2015. Heather would go on to run track at SMU, which was only in its fourth year to have a women's track program. Her class was the first to receive scholarships, so she was kind of a pioneer there, if you will. She originally competed in the eight-event heptathlon before moving on to the 800, which really became her, her race. She owned the Southwest Conference's fastest time in the event in 1993, but unfortunately fell during the uh, Southwest Conference meet in that race. Her school record time of 206.7 was a provisional time for the NCAA meet, as well as the 1992 U.S. Olympic trials. Speaking to her versatility, Heather set five school records at SMU. In addition to the 800, she owned school marks in the outdoor 400 hurdles and 1500, and in the indoor 400 and 800. 
After SMU, Heather worked for 13 years in marketing in New York City, where she met her husband, David. Moving to Houston, she worked for a division of the Houston Texans for seven years. For the last two years, she has worked doing marketing for a friend's healthcare IT company, which allows her more time to be, with a, to be a mom to her six and three-year-old boys. One of the finest female track athletes in Panhandle history, from Spearman and SMU, the 169th member of the Panhandle Sports Hall of Fame, Heather Merle Houston. It's all yours. Thank you. Wait, Cameron, don't sit down. I need to give you a hug. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> can I sit down now? You can sit down now. I frankly forgot how fast I was. I, when I got called, I was confused, and um, I remembered I, I was kind of fast back back in the day. My, um, my kids always say they can beat me now, and my husband's brother constantly challenges me to races and beats me, so I guess I lost my confidence over the years. My cousin Chad always used to um, challenge me to races too, and I'm pretty sure I beat him a couple of times though. Um, this is such an honor. I um, thank you so much to Kids Inc. and the Panhandle Sports Hall of Fame and the Amarillo Globe News. Um, I'm honored to be on the stage with these other inductees and all these amazing athletes and coaches. I was at the Canadian basketball game the other night. Y'all are really good. Yeah, my cousin that played on the Groover team. Um, when you're an athlete and you do something that you love for so long, um, it's difficult um, when, you, when you don't get to do it anymore. So you sort of, after college, I sort of had to put track in a box and put it up on a shelf somewhere because it physically hurt that I couldn't run anymore. It's been a lot of fun for me to be able to sort of take that box down from the shelf and open it back up and celebrate it again. It was such a wonderful part of my life, and I've reflected a lot since I heard about this award of um, why it was so special for me. And a lot of people have said this today, but the reason it was so special for me was not the meets in Austin. Sure, it was a lot of fun to go to Austin and win some medals there. That was thrilling, and I worked hard for those. But what was most memorable and so I'm so grateful for was running in the panhandle. You, I, never, I never felt like I was just running for Spearman or my other hometown of Groover or my family or just me. I felt like I was running for the whole pandle, panhandle. Sure, you would go to meets on Saturdays and you would for sure want to cream your competition, right? I mean, we all wanted to cream our competition, but we were all friends. And as we went on to regional and state, um, we all rooted for each other. And I've gone on to do some really great things after high school and uh, college track, but I've never felt more supported and frankly loved in my, in my life, except for my husband and children and family, of course. But uh, it is a wonderful place to have grown up. You really can't take the panhandle out of someone. I feel so lucky to have been uh, born here and grown up here, and I feel privileged that I got to run here, and so privileged that I got this award today. Um, I have, I'm very blessed with all the people that are here to support me today. I have um, my high school and junior high track coaches here with me today. Um, they were telling some mean stories about me earlier. I have my entire mother's family here who, um, Basically, my aunt and uncle are like my second parents, and I love them dearly. I have my cousins here who are like my brother and sister and all their kids who I love just as much as mine. Um, I have my dad's family here. My daddy always had this amazing way of making me feel so calm before every track meet. And Daddy, I love you. And my Dina always made sure that I had a gourmet meal before every race. I'm very lucky that I have one of my grandparents here today with me. Uh, he never missed a meet, and neither did most of my family. Um, I'm also very lucky that I married the best man in the world, David, and he's here with my two beautiful children, Hart and Holden. One of them was so excited he fell asleep during the ceremony. 
The other one I noticed has been using his iPad a little bit. It's okay. Um, most importantly, and I think all of us could, um, I hope I didn't forget anyone before this, I think most of us up, up here on this stage could dedicate this award to our mamas, but I, um, mine was really special. I think you just heard that she was an incredible athlete on her own. She, um, she still holds the Groover 200 meter record from 1972. She was an amazing athlete on her own. She, um, she and I moved to Canyon in fifth and sixth grade and she put me in summer track. And from the time I was 10 years old until I was 21, she drove me everywhere in the state. She flew everywhere in the country to watch me. She never missed a meet. She never missed a basketball game. I don't know how she had a social life. I don't know how she afforded it. I never asked her. But she's um, an amazing woman and mom. I want to share this award with you. You deserve it just as much as me. Thank you. And I need you, and not only am I sharing this with you, because I need you to take it home so my kids don't destroy it, but, but you deserve it too. Thank you, Mom. And thanks to my family. Thanks to all my coaches and my friends, my boys. And thank you again to the Panhandle Sports Hall of Fame. This is a wonderful honor. Congratulations, Heather. You know, this past year, in an effort to more easily honor the uh, athletes and, and coaches for induction from older eras, Hall of Fame Selection Committee formed a, a Legends category, making what will be an annual induction for those whose accomplishments came at least 50 years ago. Not that there haven't been that many as far back as the 1930s inducted, because there clearly have been a lot from those eras. But this was an avenue to kind of further and, and more quickly recognize those whose careers were many years ago. But make no mistake, Matt Carter of Borger would fit into any category in any decade. He was among the top two or three players who would have to be considered the Panhandle's best basketball players of the decade of the 1950s. Back in the 1940s, he was the only child of a single mother, worked in a cafe. Mac searched for fun as a young boy, not trouble, and he found it in basketball. He took to the game like a bird does to the sky. I must have shot a million hoops, he said. He came of high school age when it was kind of the, the golden age of large school athletics here in West Texas, where each larger town or city had just one high school. One high school in Borger, Pampa, Amarillo, Lubbock, Odessa, Midland, Abilene, San Angelo, all in one district. At six feet four, Mac was a talented post player. He played for the Bulldogs under Coach Tex Hanna, himself in the Panhandle Sports Hall of Fame. He's a starter for the Bulldogs as a junior and senior leading Borger both years to their first trips to the 4A state tournament, largest classification. 1951, as a junior, Borger advanced to the state semifinals before falling to hometown Austin High School in the semifinals, the victim of a stall. They lost 35-34. Well, Borger returned to the state tournament in his senior year, 1952. They won the quarterfinals, they won the semifinals, then they fell to Fort Worth Poly, 56-51 in the championship game. And like they had all year, the Borgers climbed on Mac's back figuratively in the state tournament. He had a tournament record of 75 points in three games, which was a, a tournament record that stood until just a few years ago. In the 56-51 loss to Poly, Mac had 27 points, 53% of his team's points. That summer, Mack would be invited and would play in the prestigious North-South Classic at that time in Murray, Kentucky. A number of colleges obviously wanted him, and Mack considered both Rice and the University of Texas, going so far as to buy books at UT, 
but he never quite enrolled. He did, though, enroll at one of the top programs in the country, Oklahoma A&M, which is now Oklahoma State, to play for legendary coach Hank Iba. He was a firm, no-nonsense rascal, Max said of Coach Iba, who was the head coach there from 1934 to 1970. You know, freshmen were ineligible to play in those days, so Mac was a three-year starter for the Aggies, now the Cowboys. You had to be a pretty good player to start as a sophomore for Hank Iba. And as a sophomore, A&M went to the NCAA tournament, advancing to the Elite Eight. As a junior in 1955, he was second team All-Missouri Valley Conference, averaging 12.2 points and 7.1 rebounds. And as a senior on an 18 and 9 team that was ranked number 19 in the country, Mack earned first team all conference honors, third team all American, and averaged 15 points per game, 6.3 rebounds as the Aggies went to the NIT. After college, Mack dabbled in AAU basketball and was even drafted by the Rochester Royals of the NBA, but as he said, I was only 180 pounds. But much of his adult life was spent, has been spent in Southern California. For 25 years, he was a probation supervisor in Orange County when he retired in 1990. For many years, this father of two and grandfather of five has made his home in San Clemente, California, a wonderful community there on the beach. From Borger and Oklahoma State, the 170th member of the Panhandle Sports Hall of Fame, Mr. Clayton Mack Carter. Congratulations, Mr. Carter. Very well done. I'll put it. It's all yours. I left my watch. Generally, I put it up here so I'll know that I won't run over my hour. I love it. <laughs> Generally, that works. People clear out and then we can go eat, you know. I'm number 170. That has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? That mean he's probably an old coot. That's what it probably means, you know. Who has that old coot at 170 at any rate? But I want to thank uh, uh, this group for inviting me here. It gives me a chance to come back. I'm, I have a lot of memories about this part of the world. I, uh, oh, I heard uh, Hank Williams here one time, and uh, I saw Gorgeous George here one time. There was a lot going on. Gorgeous George did a kip-up. Remember what a kip-up was? I tried one one time and got a concussion anyway, so <laughs> it wasn't any fun. It's why you lay on your back and go directly to your feet without using your hands. Hard work. Yeah. So anyway, I want to thank uh, my sister Suzanne, who made all this happen. She wrote a letter, and it got in the hands of... Uh, I think his name was Hess, Hesse, from Pampa. Yeah, yeah, and he rolled back and said, yeah, I remember Snake. We used to beat up on those guys over at Pampa pretty good, you know. And so he, uh, he did something with the letter, and a few years later, here we are. So that's the way the world turns, and that small things happen, and, make, and big things occur, I suppose it is. I want to thank all my... Uh, relatives and friends that come here from far away, Texas, Colorado, uh, Kansas. Uh, anyway, they're all right here in the first 10 rows, at least. That's, that's quite a few of them. <laughs> this is my uh, grandson, Spike, right here. He just got out of the Marines after doing five years. <laughs> He thought we were going surfing, you know. He wore him some cut-off shorts. He didn't know about Amarillo, Texas and the wind. And I want to thank my lovely uh, uh, daughter-in-law, Brenda, for making it possible to get here with some pants and the right, uh, a couple of shirts. And anyway, she's my, uh, she dresses me and she did a good job. And she did all our reservations too, so thank you very much, yeah. 
I'm trying to think what I remember most about playing basketball in Texas, and you always remember the friends, the people, and the teammates, you know. I'm looking and I see the Miller twins that live here in Amarillo, they're here. And there's Yo-Yo Newman, he's living somewhere off out in the Hinderlands, I don't know. Arkansas, isn't it? That's still there, yeah. We lost uh, an All-Stater, Jimmy Morgan. We think about him every day. We got to go to his funeral in Florida. So mostly uh, I remember about the great things that happened to us. Uh, we had some pitiful losses. We didn't have but a couple in our two years here. But the one at uh, Austin hurt the most. They stole, they stalled the ball on us right from the get-go, right from the first quarter. They got ahead of us two to nothing and shame on them anyway. It was miserable, yeah. It, it, it went on for the whole game and people were throwing things out of the stands. I got hit by a pencil, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> and then we played uh, in our senior year and we lost a game. We got beat at Abilene, wasn't that right? Abilene, Texana was infuriated. I fouled out before the half. He swore that the the referees are getting paid off. Yeah. We lost the game one time somewhere else, and he swore that we got the referees. He was a poor loser. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, we didn't get beat very often, and he told you a while ago how big this conference was. This was 1 4A, and it was all these schools. We'd go play Abilene and San Angelo, and we'd spend two nights on the road in hotels, you know. Speed, remember when the speed limit was, what was it, 55? To go from San Angelo to Borger at 50 miles an hour would take a day, remember? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, thanks again to this group that let me come here and bring my family here. And because look at them, um, they've got cousins and nieces and there's my uh, stepmother, Mae Carter, one of the best stepmothers in the world. She didn't boss you ever. Yeah, she didn't even try to be the boss. And the sisters from good gosh, well anyway, there's a bunch of them. There's, there's my sister uh, uh, Shelly, she's got a new friend. I'm gonna have to talk to him, ask him what his, in <laughs> ask him what his intentions are with my young daughter, huh? Yeah. So anyway, I hope I get to come back again sometime and see you guys. And I hope we get out of here pretty quick and get something to eat. Don't you think? Thank you. Well, if you don't mind, we're going to pause just a minute so Matt can go talk to his sister and check out this guy. <laughs> I hope you're not applauded out, and will you join with me one last time in acknowledging this latest class into the Panhandle Sports Hall of Fame. Thank you, guys. Okay, before we move on to the second half of the, pro oh no, I'm sorry, that's wrong page. Scared you to death, didn't I? Before we close, an invitation and a few thank yous. First to musician Ramon Saldana, who, he wasn't here at the first one in 1959, but he wasn't too far behind, and he adds a lot to this every year. Thank you, Ramon. I'd also like to thank David Jones, who's chairman of the Hall of Fame, for his direction. Kids Inc. Executive Director Jimmy Lackey for their work as the new headline sponsor. And most especially to uh, Stacy Knight of Kids Inc., as well as Mary Daniel and Lou Ann Garrett. You know, if you're thinking, boy, there's a lot of moving parts here and this runs pretty well, well, all you need to know is that there were women pulling the strings that no one sees. Otherwise, well, I, I don't want to think about it. Also, an appreciation goes to the sponsors who help make these ceremonies financially possible. And uh, 
I think they need to be acknowledged. They include AIG, Emerald Globe News, Emerald National Bank, Emerald Sports Commission, Bank of Commerce, Barnhill Sports Medicine, Ben and Kelly Wittenberg, Boxwell Brothers, David Jones, Happy State Bank, James Allen, Stanley and Geneva Schaefer, Aqua One, Rafkins, United Supermarkets, and Whitney Russell Printers. So you see, all of them think that this too is an important occasion. Well, you know, we wouldn't invite you here and send you off without feeding you. And I want to invite you to a reception with catered food and drink that's just right here, right behind us. You don't have to go anywhere. There's food, drink. I know there'll be back slaps and handshakes. And I've been to a lot of these. There won't be any steak, but I guarantee you there'll be plenty of bull. <laughs> Look at it this way, men. Uh, if you got your wives or your girlfriends here, you're never going to find a cheaper Valentine's Day meal. Man. <laughs> In addition, Mike Haynes and Dave Wolfarth are right back there, and they have co-authored a book on the Panhandle Sports Hall of Fame, and it's complete with extended biographies of all the inductees, and it's been updated, and they'll be there with any books that you may be interested in purchasing. And in closing, I'm, uh, I'm reminded of a quote I saw one time. I don't know if it was a locker room or is it inscribed somewhere, but in this gathering of athletes and coaches, I think it fits very well. It said, in life, don't sweat the petty stuff, but also be careful and don't pet the sweaty stuff. <laughs> and now Hall of Fame committee member Jack Knight will offer our benediction, and on its conclusion, you are dismissed. And thank you for your attendance. Wow, what a great day. Let's please stand for the benediction. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for your presence with us this day, and we thank you for the time that we've had here to recognize the outstanding accomplishments of these players and coaches alike. And may you bless each person uh, here who took the time together here today and also for those who spent many hours putting this together and taking part in this great ceremony. Now, now may your hand of protection be on all of us as we leave and go to our homes. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Good. Thank Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good job. Let me shake your hand.